Okay, hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being with us for the Video Marketing for Libraries webinar. My name is Paula Newcomb. I am the Northeast Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library. Today I am at the Kendallville Public Library and I will be the host and question moderator for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Jenna Anderson, Marketing Specialist at the Kendallville Public Library. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. The Indiana State Library has many ways to stay connected to library staff across the state. On this page you'll see various social media accounts listed. I've also included the link for our new Professional Developments Archive Trainings website and also for weekly updates um, for upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the, across the state. Please subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Wednesday Word. We also offer a blog with, which provides information about the Indiana State Library collection, interview spotlights on library staff from across the state, and also information about upcoming events at the Indiana State Library. This webinar is provided as part of the Library Trends and Hot Topics series. To register for other webinars available or trainings av available from across the state, please um, see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.library.in.gov. And included, included on this calendar are events at the Indiana State Library and other library events across the state of Indiana. For a full list of our current in-person training menu, please see our continuing education website. So during this webinar, um, if you have questions, just type, type in the chat box on the upper left side of the screen. What we're going to try to do is Jenna's written some um, she's got some spots that she's going to stop and take questions. So if you want to hold off until she asks um, for, about questions, we'll do that. And I'll also be watching and get your question to our presenter as soon as there's a good opportunity. There should also be a time near the end of this webinar for questions. Um, today's session is one hour, so you'll get one LEU for today, and I will be sending those out within 30 days of this presentation. And if any time, at any point during the webinar, if you experience any technical issues, just please enter that into our chat box. I will now turn the presentation over to Jenna Anderson. Thank you, Paula. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad you could join us today. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself before we get started. Um, I have a degree in broadcasting from Vincennes University. I worked in television for several years before I came to library marketing. I'm still currently a freelance uh, video producer. I've done some things for Depew Orthopedics, I've done things for local companies, and I've actually done things for a few libraries as well. I've only been full-time for about a year, so most of the things that I've been doing have been done on a part-time basis. So when I say it doesn't take a whole lot of time and money to do some of these things, I really do mean it doesn't take a whole lot of time and money to do some of these things. Um, the biggest benefit to me is that uh, my husband, is also a video producer who has um, won three Emmys, so he's a little good at what he does, and he doesn't mind when I ask him questions about some, <laughs> you know, when I run into trouble with my editing software and things like that. So he is a big benefit to me, that's for sure. Let's talk about a few of the things that we are going to go over today. Uh, we'll start with some of the common video industry terms. I use a lot of terminology that, that may not be um, known to the general public, so I'll talk about some of those things. We'll talk about why we would do videos in the first place. I will talk about some of the types and types of videos that I have made and that might interest you to make as well. And we'll talk about the equipment elements and software that are required to do this sort of thing. And that's the point where we'll really stop and we'll take some questions. Once we get through the necessary equipment, um, that's where we'll stop and we'll take some questions. After that, then we'll talk about really what it takes to make the video. And then once you've made it, what is the best thing to do with it? What am I going to do with it now? So let's start with talking about um, some of the language that you're going to hear me say during today's webinar. Voiceover is the recorded voice of the narrator. So in some cases, depending on the type of video that you're doing, having a voiceover may actually help tell your story, but it's not absolutely necessary all the time, and I'll show you some examples of that. A soundbite, or SOT, this is a recorded interview with a subject. So it's not usually something you run in its entirety. It's something you would basically chop up into smaller bites and kind of sprinkle them throughout the video. And you'll see some examples of that as well. B-roll is really the meat of the video. This is a video that you take to play over and around those voiceovers and sound bites. Um, it's, it's really 
the number one thing that you're going to need if you want to make a video. Nat sound is short for natural sound. This could be the music that's playing at a concert, the sound of children laughing at one of your events, or even, you know, for instance, the sound of an instructor teaching a class. When they aren't, when they aren't being directly interviewed, that, of course, would be a sound bite. We'll see some examples of that as well. Cut is going to be uh, the edit made in the video editing process, so we'll talk about that. Shoot or shot, this is the act of gathering video or the view from the camera. So, for instance, when you are shooting video, I might say, or I have a video shoot this afternoon. Um, shot is, like I said, what you see through your camera lens. So you might hear me say something like, move that stack of books out of my shot, please. And finally, post or post-production. This is the portion of your project where you are actually sitting down and editing. So something you might do in post would be to add graphics, fix the audio, fix some of the camera shots, that sort of thing. So we will talk about all of that as we get into actually making your video. So why would we do videos in the first place? Really, why not? It's a way for us to get the word out in a new way and even to a new audience. Our marketing efforts really need to expand because our library services are expanding. And the next step for many libraries can be video because, like I said, it doesn't have to be as time consuming as it sounds. Websites and social media make it really easy for us to share our video messages with our patrons and even the rest of the world. We have a video, and I'll show you a clip of that here in a little bit, that because it was on posted on YouTube, our summer adventure video is what I'm referring to, was picked up by librarians all across the country who called to ask about the changes that we were doing during last year's summer reading program. So really that was able to start a wonderful conversation in our own state and, and even beyond. Another reason that you would do a video would be to tell a story. We are full of stories and obviously they're not all on the shelves. We have stories to tell about what we offer. We have stories of how patrons use our library. We have stories about how we fit into our communities. And videos are a great visual way to tell those stories. It's also a really good way to connect with our patrons. Our patrons really have a, a variety of interests. And engaging them with a video on some subjects that interest them can also help generate an interest in the library. Seeing these videos might make them discover new things that they didn't realize we even had. Um, just because someone may be really into knitting, for an example, and you'll see why I use that as an example here in a little bit, it doesn't mean that they're looking at our library's calendar to see what kind of knitting groups and knitting classes we offer. But if they see a video maybe that we've created that's shared by one of their friends or shared, they just, you know, searching YouTube happen to find it, then we're going to get um, potentially some new business, if you will, from that video. <clears throat> okay, so let's start talking about the types of videos. I'm going to show you, as we go through this, I'll have several video clips. I'm not going to be able to show you everything in its entirety. Uh, that would take, <laughs> it would probably become a two-hour webinar if I did that. So we'll just show uh, quick clips of, of some of the videos that I have. Everything is posted on YouTube, and at the end I'll give you our YouTube address so that you can go on yourself and you can watch them in their entirety if you'd like. I also will uh, mention that because we're watching videos and some of them are live on YouTube, it might have a slight delay or they may be a little jumpy, so I just want to warn you ahead of time. So let's talk first about um, live feeds and quick bites. These are videos that Facebook even, for instance, makes it really easy to create. Um, using my iPhone, I recently went live when Splat the Cat and Pete the Cat were making their interest into an event. Um, and later I posted a clip of Pete dancing to a school shoe song with kids. So that's something that, that kids really enjoyed. And actually, um, we have Elephant and Piggy coming to the library today, so I may very well do the same thing. So let me just play this video for you. You know, it's not great. Shot on my iPhone. Just a quick little kip, clip of the kids playing. You might have a little bit of difficulty hearing the audio. It is a little soft on there. So I'll try to move the mic just a little bit closer for you. Oh. Let's try this again, shall we? <laughs> Not very exciting, but you know what? The kids were having a good time, and parents like to see it online, so that was fun for them. But I do want to warn you, uh, probably best not to go live too often. 
I don't know if any of you have had the same experience that I've had, but we have local TV stations, and, and one of them felt the need to go live from behind the scenes every morning at the same time with the same shot. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I ended up having to unlike their page because I just couldn't take it anymore. So if you do it too often, it's not special, and your patrons aren't going to respond to it so much anymore. So I would just I would use that that feature sparingly. Okay, event compilation videos. This is uh, where you can showcase your library's events. These can be shot and edited very simply using any kind of camera, really. Um, you can add music or simply use the net sound that you get at, the, at that event. The sample videos that I'm going to show you um, really show a variety of ways that these videos can be produced. So this first one is Cirque Among Us. So what this is, is it's on YouTube, so it's going to take a minute for it to catch up with me. It's a mix of GoPro shots and shots that I actually got with my camera, simply with a musical overlay. So we'll play a few seconds of this. Okay, so that's just a quick glimpse of, of what that um, compilation video was about. This one is a little bit different. This is Adam Gidwitz. He was here for a, um, he was our guest speaker for our Climbing Creative Writing Contest a couple years ago. And this is really just a, a, a quick snippet of, of his talk. Now, I did record his entire, his entire hour-long talk with the kids, but what I did was I cut it down into smaller pieces that were, roughly between three and five minutes, I believe. So this one happens to be where he's talking about his inspiration. So, you know, people really don't want to sit and watch a really long video. They want shorter snippets. So this is a great way to share some information from a guest speaker. So I'll just show you just a little bit of this. story is pretty funny from there, but unfortunately we don't have time to listen to all of it. Um, and I will explain here in a little bit when we start talking about actually getting the video why I had video of him from the side. Not ideal. I didn't have him mic'd, um, but I'll explain why I did all that here when we start talking about actually getting the video. This is Big Truck Day. So what this is, is it's an example. We've used that sound in this. Um, we use some sound bites. So you'll get to see a little different way to create an event compilation video. This one has a little bit more, it, it has a little bit more work into it. And I do want to warn you off the top, this audio you'll probably be able to hear really good. There's a loud truck horn at the beginning, so I don't want to scare any of you, but you're going to hear a loud truck horn there at the beginning. So that was really great information. Um, we also not only talked to the fire department, but we talked to the police department, we talked to a farmer. So I had sound bites um, mixed in with some, you know, children's reaction to those to those um, pieces of equipment. So like I said, you'll be able to watch all of these on our YouTube page in their entirety if you want. Next up, uh, we're going to talk about promotion and image videos. These videos really help reinforce your library's brand. They can be used to promote an upcoming event. They can talk about a specific library service, or they can just showcase a feature of your library. Now, I will warn you that these videos are more labor intensive to shoot and edit. They're, they're more complex in a lot of cases. I have some examples here of some of the promotion and image videos that I've done. 
This one is a little bit more simple. Um, it's about the Cricut pens. It's something new that we had just gotten. So this was one of the new services. It was easy to feature because it was very visual. And, you know, I probably wouldn't do a video to, um, well, I probably could, but it'd be a little bit more difficult to do a video showcasing, for instance, the state park passes that are available this year. Um, but that would be more labor intensive. This was very simple. It's a single shot of the Cricut working, and it's just my voice talking over it, talking about the Cricut pen. So I'll just show you a few seconds of this. Try using our new Cricut pens in the Cortex. They fit into the Cricut to draw instead of cut. You can use them to add writing to a project or even use them to create custom coloring pages. We have a set of black pens with tips of varying width, and we also have a metallic set. So like I said, that one was just one, that whole entire video is one shot of the Cricut drawing and just me talking about it. Not a, a real labor intensive video to do. This is our summer adventure video, and this is what I was talking about um, at the beginning. This reinforces our library culture. It helped us create a sense of community, and it helped promote our upcoming event. And this is the one that reached all across the country because we had received several inquiries from libraries all around the country who were interested in learning more about how we shook up summer last year. So starting with this video and moving forward, they're really a little, the ones I'm going to show you are really a little bit more labor intensive and take some more planning on your part. Um, this one and a lot of them will have interviews and B-roll at a number of locations around the community. This particular one um, involved interviews with the library director, the mayor, the United Way director, a local daycare director. So there was a lot involved in this one. And when you're, when you're choosing videos, when you're planning to do videos, um, you need to choose wisely what which ones you're going to spend more time on. This one was very much worth the time and effort that was put into it. So I'll just play you just a little bit of this one as well. Forget summer reading as you know it. The Kenneville Public Library has created a whole new adventure so you can experience the unexpected. We decided to do a complete overhaul of our summer reading program because changing it a little bit wouldn't have made a very big impact. And we really want to deepen the impact that we have on the community. Gone are the days of the individual reading record. This year our goal is community-wide. If everyone can band together to read 30,000 books by July 30th, the library will fund one of three community projects. The first is an adventure walk. We're working with the park departments in Kendaville and Rome City to create plans for this activity. Stands will be placed along a path, and families can read a story or complete challenges as they walk. This project is a favorite of Noble County's United Way director. I think it's a great interactive opportunity for parents and children. Great um, conversation starter for parents with kids and just a great way to get out and enjoy what we have to offer here in Canada. And in case you're wondering, um, the adventure walk that you just saw did win. Uh, we had the quote that we got for that project from a company that does it was about $14,000 for the 27 stands that we wanted to be able to put in Kenneville and Rome City. And um, we ended up, we got enough donations, the actual work donated from the community that I believe all told it cost us under $1,000 to do. So we were extremely lucky with that with that project. Um, and actually, it's not quite out yet. The, uh, all the stands are sitting in our basement ready to be, inst be installed as we speak. So hopefully within the next month or so, those will get put in our parks and uh, we can start using those. Okay, this next one is featuring our family events. So this particular one features painting, but it talks really about all the family offerings that we have. This one, a video like this is a little bit easier to shoot because it was really focused on one event contained in one period of time. So the video that I got of the event, the staff and patron interviews were all done at the same time, and that part of it took about an hour. So here's a little piece of this video. events have become a focus for activities at the Kenneville Public Library. The most popular? Family painting events, held every one or two months. Registration is usually limited to 80, and these activities fill early, sometimes months before they happen. At this particular event, families with kids in kindergarten and up came together to paint an elephant. They were led step by step by adult services manager, Cindy Patterson. On the edge of your elephant, I would point it with a small brush. While we're working department with department, there is an emphasis on can this age group accomplish this task. 
And if this age group does, are we going to leave behind this older age or vice versa? So with these family paint classes, it's a middle ground for all ages. So something like this art class, art is so subjective. You can do what you want to do with it. And so, you know, we have pictures that we here, here, all of them looking like elephants, but in a very different way. And so it still allows for them to use their creativity and still get benefit from the program, but it, it fits a wide range. Uh, the next one, this one is about knitting classes. So this gives an example of some of the value-added events we host. This one focuses a little bit more on the craft itself of knitting and a little bit less on what the library offers, although we do talk about um, specifically what the library offers for people who are interested in knitting. Videos like this one are really um, the perfect way to help connect with your community, like I talked about before, because videos and marketing your library really they don't have to be, and they really shouldn't, in my opinion, always be only about what your library has to offer. Be sh you can create videos that don't focus on your library, but really engage the community and its interests, and this is one that heads in that direction. Oh, yeah. These, these are nice. These are nice. Oh, even cows and girls would like to be like that. Knitting has made a comeback, and the Kenderville Public Library is helping teach these skills to anyone who wants to learn the craft. It started with Rockin' Knitters, a time for experienced needleworkers to relax in the cortex and chat with friends. Then it grew to KnitNet, where elementary age children receive a hands-on training in a variety of ways to knit. Then came KnitWit, a beginner's class for adults. It's taught by Carol Ferrero. Do you like to work with these? Uh, it depends. I like these. It's better on my hand. And you don't need stitches. No, you don't drop the needles out either. It's also true that you don't drop needles when you aren't even using needles to knit. The first few knit net classes taught children how to make a scarf with their fingers and then their hands. Okay. Well, these and that. And we teach classes like this because they're hands-on, interactive programs that teach a skill to children that they can very easily the cortex is also a very hands on Okay, moving on from that one. This one is about checking out a kitten or cat at the library. This is something that we did, uh, I think it was beginning of 2016. I don't remember exactly. Um, but what this does is this promotes the library's event, but very little. What it's really doing is it's really providing information about an important resource in our community. And videos that feature more than just your library really have the potential to reach a lot of people outside our library community, and this one definitely didn't. I think we all know that the people who don't come into your library on a regular basis are probably the most difficult to reach. So if you're focusing more on your community, you're going to have more people who are going to share this on social media, more people who are going to see it and take an interest in it in general. for finding where to put them, who can go with who, knowing their personality so that way when people do come in um, to adopt a cat, I can usually tell them who might be the best fit for them based on questions that I can ask them. So you're kind of like a matchmaker. <laughs> yes, yes. Matchmaker is probably a, a great way to describe me. I'm, I'm kind of the matchmaker. If they want to know, can they, do they get along with dogs? Do they get along with other cats? I'm usually the one that can tell them yes or no. We've gotten close to being under 100 um, a few times, but usually that's right about the time when kitten season hits. And when kitten season hits, which is twice a year, we get bombarded. So that one, you know, it's a really good day when you can convince your boss that you need to go spend the day playing with cats. <laughs> so some of these community, community videos are great just to get away from the library, learn a little bit more about your community, and help showcase what's going on in, in your community. And actually, that video was a couple minutes long. We didn't even talk about the program about checking out a cat, a kitten, cat or kitten at your library until the very end. And I think if I remember correctly, I just put up, um, I just basically put the flyer on the screen. That was all it was. It was really about um, what, what was important to our community. And what's important to our community is important to us as well. This one, I'll just show you a couple seconds of this. This is um, featuring the Dave Budden Art Show. 
not so much about the art show. You'll see a slide um, at the beginning at the, and at the end that promotes the art show. This is really about Dave and his art to help drum up interest. I didn't, I, I didn't take art in high school, but uh, after I'd gotten out of high school, I became friends with East Noble's first art teacher, Don Moore. Uh, through his friendship, um, it was just a real gradual thing. I, I started drawing. And this video then goes on to talk a little bit more about um, how Dave grew into his art and what led to him having so many beautiful pieces um, and such a, such a great talent for pencil drawing. So really to drum up interest in Dave and then hopefully in turn um, giving people incentive to come and view his art show. This is, um, this is about the Simpsons guy. This is a fun way to show how some use the library. I've gotten some information of, um, from our branch about this guy who thinks he's, who calls himself Bart Simpson. Um, he is trying to get into the Guinness Book of World Records for having the largest Simpsons collection in the world. And I think he's pretty darn close to that. <laughs> he was meeting with um, one of our staff members' children after school, and they were working on some Simpsons art projects together. So it's really kind of a cool way that people are using library. They're, they're not just coming in to check out books or check out DVDs. They're coming in to hang out and do these cool projects. And it's just a, I think it's just a fun thing to feature. So I'll just play you a few minutes of this, a few seconds of this. Came here about a mm, couple, three days a week or so with the internet at the house, just kind of acting up. I came here and got online and he recognized me from Parkside when I did my Simpsons presentation for my Simpsons collection. Um, and he, we started working on projects. We found some smart ones. We made one for him. I want one for myself. We made one for myself and then we made a Maggie and went from there. We just finished Maggie today. Um, my grandma actually had a huge thing of them. I just thought that they were for necklaces and stuff for the girls to make when I was little. And then um, I saw um, Haley that works here. She was having um, kids work on them for like a project thing. The hardest part was to get the, yeah, finding the colors and the black outlines probably the hardest part too to get the border done. So that was just kind of a fun video for us to do. Uh, didn't have a whole lot to do with the, with the library, um, more featuring some people in our community, but uh, it's just a really interesting way that people are using our library. Okay, so let's move on to the last category, which is training and instructional videos. These can be useful both for patrons and our staff, so they can help our patrons learn our services, and it can also familiarize new staff members with some of the aspects of their job. It's also a great refresher for some staff members who maybe don't do something on a regular basis, so they need a reminder, um, a refresher on how to do that. So I've got some options here. So this first one is um, going to be a video that I created on for our patrons on Evergreen Indiana. And I've done some of these for Evergreen Indiana on, on Evance. So those of you who have Evanced um, know that your patrons can register for events and um, reserve meeting rooms and things like that online. So I've created some videos on how they can do that. So this is really an example of using screen capture with a voiceover and a few stills and motion graphics thrown in. And the one I'm going to show you here demonstrates how patrons can access their Evergreen Indiana account online. I think we have to move on. I'm just checking the time. <laughs> so we'll just do a few little clips of those. Um, let's move on to, this one is um, a video on how to use our 3D printer. We have a makerspace and some of the equipment that's within the makerspace we require certification. So how we do that to make it really convenient for patrons is I created these how-to videos on how to use our 3D printer and our Cricut and our sewing machine and our embroidery machine. And they can watch these videos and then they can take a brief quiz. 
And if they score 70% or higher on that quiz, then they are considered certified. So this is just a little sample of the 3D printer video. Welcome to the Cortex, a Kendaville Public Library makerspace. This video will train you to use the MakerBot Replicator, a 3D printer, which requires certification. To use the 3D printer, you will need to provide a file you have created with one of the following extensions, .stl, .obj, or .thing. You may bring your file into the Cortex on a flash drive or download it via email. That one basically um, keeps going on with, with close-ups, screenshots of, of how step-by-step -step on how to use a 3D printer. Same kind of uh, concept for the other pieces of equipment that I've done that on. Okay, this next one is just going to show you a, a brief look at a training video. This is, I would say, by far the easiest videos that I've done because really all it is is a screen capture and I'm recording my voice directly into the computer and I'm simply uploading it. Um, we keep our training videos for our patrons and staff and our Cortex videos as well, like the one I just showed you. We have Niche Academy. You may have heard of that. That is a, um, an offering that you can have by an, for an annual subscription. Um, this one is for our staff only, so it's, it's private, so patrons can't view this, but we do have the, the two additional academies. We have the Cortex Academy for our patrons to learn how to use that makerspace equipment, and then we have what's called KPL Connect, where they can find um, the videos that Niche Academy provides for us, as well as the videos I've created on Evergreen and Evance. So give me just a second. I've got to go to a website here and get make sure I'm logged in so we can view this one briefly. I can't play too much of it because it does have some proprietary information, <laughs> but I'll show you a little sample. Like I said, it's literally just me walking through the process with a, with Hello, a screen everyone. grabber. We are going to talk about entering a single event on Evans. So you may have a link on your desktop, you may have a link in your browser, that's great, you can use those, but there is also a link on Yammer, so you can get to Evans staff side events from there. Um, if to log in, your login is going to be L I. Let's not go any further there. <laughs> I think you have your all have your own logins for those of you who are using Evanced. Let's get back to the PowerPoint here. Okay, so now let's talk about the equipment. And once I get through the equipment, then I think, do we have some questions, Paul? Okay, we'll take some questions at that time. Okay, so we're gonna kind of maybe speed it up a little bit in here. So first thing you need, obviously, is a camera. But you can really use anything from an iPhone to a GoPro, to a handheld, you know, Sony Handycam that costs $100, to a DSLR that's several thousand. What I have now is an in-between model. I have a Canon XA10. It has XLR ports. It retails for about $1,500, and really the only reason I was able to get that was because our friends of the library group saw value in what I was doing and was willing to make the purchase for me. But you can also look for contributions from local businesses. If you have a local Photoshop in town, you know, they might donate something in exchange for some ads or even a thank you at the end of the videos. Or there is a possibility even for rental equipment from local stores, video production companies, things like that. But honestly, you know what? People are shooting movies on iPhones. <laughs> so you can do most of this. And I do use my iPhone for a lot of shots anyway. So you can really do most of this on virtually any kind of camera that you have. A microphone is going to be recommended if you're doing interviews, and there are really a variety of microphones that work with all cameras that even have microphones for iPhones. Um, lavalier mics are the ones that would pin to your shirt and be small. Stick mics are available. They're both wired and wireless, and what you need really depends on what you do. I have both the lavalier mic and a stick mic. Um, I usually use the stick mic for better sound quality, and it's basically it's just more dependable. Wireless versions tend to get interference and you'll have really a continued cost in batteries. Um, and I don't know if you noticed in some of the videos to spice up my stick mic, I created a KPL mic flag for it. So I have a three-sided mic flag that has our logo on all sides. Obviously not necessary. I just thought it was fun to do. Okay, lighting. Special lighting is usually not necessary, but make sure that you're paying attention to the lighting situation wherever you're shooting. I don't, I don't have any lighting. Um, I haven't, to this point, had a need for it, but I do try to position my subjects so there's plenty of light and, you know, very little shadow, so pay attention to your surroundings. The kind of camera you use can affect your lighting needs, too. 
some have adjustable irises, some just work better in low light situations. But if you find that you do need light, there is some small LED lighting that's available that can be mounted on top of most cameras. They run under $100 and a lot of them have um, adjustable brightness. So it can work in, in a lot of different situations. Headphones, I think, are important. If you're going to be editing video, you want a decent pair of headphones to be able to hear the audio clearly while you edit. And actually, headphones work best rather than earbuds because they really cancel out more of the surrounding noise. And you can plug them directly into your camera. That will help you make sure that you're recording good audio at the time. Because really, not all cameras that you're going to have are going to show you your audio levels. So you want to make sure that you're recording audio so that you don't get back to your office and realize, oh, I have video, but that person's speaking silently. <laughs> I've done it before. You don't want to do it, trust me. <laughs> Tripod or monopod is important. I actually just bought a monopod for myself last night because I like those better. They're easier to use and transport, um, but unlike a tripod, they can't be left unattended. So if you need to walk away for a second, uh, you're not going to fare too well if you've got your camera on a monopod. There's all kinds of different camera accessories that you can buy, especially when you're, you know, when you're using a GoPro. Most really aren't necessary. Some of them can be fun to use. Um, I love using the GoPro and the the uh, head attachment. The uh, uh, I can't even think of what it's called right now, but it mounts on it mounts on their head. I love putting that thing on kids' heads and having them run around at a program. You can probably see in, in the Cirque Among Us that that's what I did. So they have so much fun doing that. Um, but also accessories that you might want to have would be extra batteries, extra SD cards, that sort of thing. And another piece of equipment that I use a lot is a screen recorder. It's really the easiest way to do screen capture, especially for those training videos. Um, and if you're going to want to do that, you're going to want to invest in a USB microphone as, as well. They're really inexpensive, under $20. You can get a good one. Um, I will mention I use the Ice Cream, Ice Cream screen recorder. I love the functionality of it. It does have some quirks, though. Um, it won't play the audio on all media players, and so it can be difficult. So if you don't want to download the VLC media player or if you're going to try to edit with that, with audio that you've recorded through that screen recorder, you might want to seek out another one. I found that out after I'd already bought it, but I am able to work around it, thank goodness. Okay, some of the elements for your videos. The first thing would be music. Whether or not you need music really depends on the type of video that you're using and the other, other audio that's available. Music can help set the mood, um, even if you're using a nat sound, nat sound or a voiceover, you can make videos with or without music. Motion graphics, um, the need for motion graphics, which is kind of what I had at the beginning of some of the videos, it really depends on the type of video, your budget, and to some extent your capabilities. I mentioned my husband, who's an expert at this sort of thing. If I didn't have him, I probably wouldn't be doing motion graphics on my own. So I'm getting better at it, but I still have questions and still need his help from time to time. Stock video is another element that you may or may not need. Um, again, the video that you're doing really determines your need for stock video. The video that I use in, my, in, in the pieces that I make, I get it myself. I've only ever used stock video twice. Um, once, I think you saw, was for the... Well, you may, it may have been later in, in the Dave Button video, but I had close-up of someone drawing on a piece of paper, and then I, at one point, got video for a meeting, because I needed, it was to um, reserve our meeting rooms on Evanced, and I didn't want to go bug someone who was in our meeting rooms to get video, so I just used stock video for that. Okay, software. <clears throat> and as soon as I get through software, we'll, we'll take some questions. These are just a few of the options available. Um, I use Adobe Premiere Pro for my editing software. This is available now through Creative Cloud. You can choose a single app, like Adobe Premiere Pro, for $19.99 a month. It's not ideal to have a monthly fee, but that is what Adobe is primarily doing to us now. There is also Premiere Elements that's available. This is the more consumer version. has a lot of great features. I think it would work for most of us. It can be purchased in a bundle. With Photoshop Elements, if you're familiar with TechSoup, um, they have it for $27. iMovie, very popular for some people, costs $4.99 for iOS and $14.99 for macOS. So that is an option if you um, 
want to edit on your iPad or if you have a Mac and want to use it, that's a pretty inexpensive way to edit video. Wondershare Filmora is free. I haven't used it. I have looked into it. It has some good tools, which I think would probably uh, work for a lot of us. So that's something you could give a try if you're starting out. If you, you know, you're not sure if this is something you want to get into, you could um, get that for free and give it a try. I will mention the YouTube editor. Um, it's free. I don't recommend it because you have to upload your video and audio to YouTube first. Um, and I don't know about you, but when I upload something to YouTube, I want to make sure that it is complete and ready to be viewed by the masses. Okay, Paul, do we have some questions? Yes, let me go back to it. Scott had a great question. He says, I'd like to know what other roles you have in the library. Just video? It, we'll start with that. Okay. And then he has some more questions. Okay. I, um, like I said, I just became full-time about a year ago, and my role is strictly marketing. So I do virtually all the marketing for the library. I handle the website. I handle all the flyers. I handle the newsletters. I handle the signage that's in the library. I handle the news releases. I handle, did I mention social media? <laughs> I may have, I don't know. So anything that you can think of that would be considered marketing for the library, that's what I do. So I was concerned about being able to fit videos into my schedule. Um, I will admit going full-time helped, but I was doing it as well before, um, before I became a full-time employee. How many people in your department? Me. <laughs> Just me. Um, when I first started, we actually had, uh, I was a half person, so our department was two people, and it was about 70 hours. Um, then about 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago, um, it became one 32-hour-a-week department, and that was me. And uh, so now, just now, uh, about 11 years later, it's become a one-person full-time department. And finally with Scott, he says, when we wear several hats, how do we fit video in amongst all our other duties? That's, it can be difficult, um, and I'd be happy to talk to you more one-on-one, -on -one, Scott, about, about how I do it and maybe about what your situation is. You have to, you have to decide if it's worth it. You have to want it. Um, I have done a lot of shuffling lately. I am constantly looking at my processes, looking at the way I do things, and trying to figure out um, maybe where I can cut back on something that may not be working or may not be as effective for us so that I can fit more of these things in that I think may be more effective or, or may help get our word out there better. So it's really, it's really just looking closely at what you do and, and really wanting to make it happen and, and recognizing that that's something that's important for you in your library. Two other questions. Um, maybe someone, maybe Portia answered this already on our chat, but uh, what was the third camera after iPhone and GoPro? DSLR. Um, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what that stands for, but it's it's basically one of those, um, I'm, not, I'm going to do a horrible job <laughs> describing this, but uh, a Canon Canon 5D, for instance, if you want to look up what that is, it basically looks like one of the old Canon film cameras, but it does do um, video and still photos, which, which is great. Um, that's what I have, my husband and I have personally, and so that's actually what I started using. Um, but then, you know what, it, it can do way more than what I really needed it to, so that's why I went down. Digital single lens reflex. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> I know what it is. Didn't know exactly what the name for it was. But um, it, it really, for me, does a lot more than what I need it for. So that's why I wanted to get back to just a, primarily just a, a video camera. And also, uh, where do you get the music that you use for your videos? We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I have, that's one of the things I have coming up. Um, I have a service that I I, um, it's called Audio Jungle. It's part of Envato Market, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a little bit. But um, I purchase my music on a case-by-case -case basis. So sometimes when I can reuse things, I reuse things. But um, sometimes I, I want something new, so I, I keep, a, keep an account going with, 
that, and so I'm just able to purchase against the amount of money that I put in there. Okay, ready to move on? All right. Thank you for your questions, everybody. And um, holy cow, we've got 15 minutes. Okay, I'm going to move a little bit faster, so bear with me, guys. Okay, so we're going to talk about getting the audio and video. One thing that you might need, depending on your policies, is consent forms. We here at the Kenneville Public Library operate on the policy that you're in a public place. We do usually ask you if it's okay to take photos and video of you when you're at a program. Um, and our staff really does know our regulars pretty well, so we tend to know who doesn't want to be on video and camera, so we can stay away from those folks. Have a plan. Before you start shooting, you really need to know what your final project is going to be and what elements you need. Whether you need to get sound bites, whether you need B-roll, whether you know you're going to have good NAT sound. So have a plan so that when you come back to your office and sit down to edit, you realize you're missing something. That's not what you want to have happen. Know where you will be shooting. Evaluate your lighting. Adjust yourself accordingly. If you're shooting in an unfamiliar location, be sure to scout it in advance because that will help you be prepared for the environment that you're going to be shooting in. Arrange your interviews, even in, in advance if you can. Um, I had to do, obviously, a lot of that with our summer adventure video. You know, schedule with the people, make sure it was okay for me to come talk to them, when was best for them. So that, that did take a lot of work. <clears throat> know your equipment. It took me a while to get the audio figured out when I first got my Canon XA10. Uh, you may have noticed that in some of the videos that I showed you. The audio was usable, wasn't ideal. So uh, be sure that you are aware of your equipment before you really jump into it and how to properly use it. Okay, so we'll run through some professional tips for getting video. Use a tripod or a monopod for steady video, especially if you have a handheld camera. Even the small Sony Handycam that I um, was using at the very, very beginning has a port to attach to a tripod. Even smartphones, you can attach them to tripods if you want to. Um, so there's really, you know what, I bought a monopod last night, it cost me $14. Not a huge expense, but I think it's really going to make a difference in your video. Make sure the subjects and activities that you're shooting aren't backlit. Conducting interviews or shooting video with a window in the background makes lighting difficult, and that's why I was um, getting video of Adam Gidwitz from the side, because we had windows all around us, and that was really about the only uh, position where I would have been able to see his face. <laughs> he would completely have been in shadow had I tried to shoot him from the front. So make sure the windows are behind you, unless you really have a reason to be getting your windows, windows in the shot. Frame your shots as you're shooting. So if you want to get a close-up, zoom in with your camera. If you want to get a wide shot, zoom out. What this is going to do is it's going to save you time in the editing process because you're not having to crop your video when you're sitting in post-production editing it. Shoot short clips. Um, that also makes editing easier. So if you keep your camera moving for the entire hour that you're filming a program, you're going to have a lot of in and out points to set, a lot of editing to do. If you're starting and, start, starting and stopping your camera um, for about the length of a, of a shot that you want, then you're going to be able to drag and drop those clips in. It's just going to make your editing process a lot more, a lot smoother. And be sure when you're using a microphone, you're using a directional microphone for, for quality audio. It works great for both NAT sound and interviews. Um, the stick mic that I use is directional. Omnidirectional mics are the ones that you have installed in your camera, and they can pick, out a lot of, pick up a lot of background noise. It's okay in some, situ some situations, but if you want to focus on one thing, it's not good. You also need to be aware if you're capturing um, audio off of your camera that because it's omnidirectional, it's going to hear you as well. So if you're whispering to someone, or your clothes are rubbing together, or you're coughing, or you're moving equipment, all of that's going to be picked up by your microphone. Okay, here's some of the extras that you might need for your video. Um, I haven't used all of these that I'm going to mention, but I did do a bit of online research. They seem to be legit, <laughs> but before you jump into it, you're going to want to check them out for yourself. Videvo, I found, um, that has some options for some free videos and motion graphics. Pexels video is free for um, personal or commercial use. I believe that has some stock video on it. Video Blocks is about a $99 a year membership. You can get a discount on that sometimes. I have that myself. Um, it's okay. <laughs> like I said, I'm not using a lot of stock video. There is still a cost for some videos, though, even when you have a membership. They just give you a discounted price for those videos. So, eh, there's, eh, yeah, it's not the cheapest way to go, I don't think. Envato is what I was talking about for audio. Um, this is what I use. I use Audio Jungle and I use Video Hive. 
um, Audio Jungle has music and sound effects. Video Hive has stock videos and After Effects templates, which is After Effects is another motion graphics program that Adobe offers. Um, I can purchase individually on Envato from Envato Market or with a block of credits. And what I usually do is in the beginning of the year, I, I put money in there so I have a block of credits available that I can just download um, what I need to throughout the year. Free Music Archive lets you search for music and certain types of licenses. So that might be a good resource. Or if you're really into music uh, with a little bit of interest, talent, and five bucks, with a Mac or iOS device, you can make your own music with GarageBand. Or you can come to our makerspace and use our use our iMacs to do that. <laughs> okay, editing. Okay, sorry I have to go through this so quickly, guys. <laughs> the time really got away from me. I can't teach you how to do your editing in an hour, <laughs> but I can hopefully give you a few tips that will make it easier. And you can always contact me up after if you have any additional questions. So if you are doing video with a voiceover, listen back to the sound bites you got and choose the actual sections that you're planning to use in the video. Transcribe them and then write your voiceover script around them. I hope that makes sense. I know I'm using a lot of terms that we talked about in the very beginning. Also, if your video is going to have a voiceover, write to the video that you have. Talk about the specific things that you're showing and use that B-roll in the correct place in your piece. If you're doing a voiceover, record your audio using a high quality microphone. For instance, like the same one that you use to record your sound bites. That's what I do. I just run my microphone, hook it up to the camera, and just sit in my office and, and record the audio that I need to record. All video editing systems require you to import video and audio. I will caution you, though, that some like Premiere don't actually import the video, but link to the location of the video on your computer. That's important because if you move your clips while you're in the editing process, Premiere is not going to be able to find them. You will need to relink them all to continue editing. So, upload the video to the final destination where it's going to stay. And then for the entire editing process, leave it in that same place. You can move it after that if you're not planning to re-edit it again. And know which track is which. Most video editing systems have multiple tracks for audio and video. Your voiceover and sound bites can go on one audio track because they usually won't overlap. Music can go on a separate track because it is going to overlap. Your video tracks can be used for sound bites, B-roll, still photos, motion graphics, all of those things. And I know, I know it's very difficult. We're just talking <laughs> over a webinar. I can't show you what I mean. But again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. OK, a few quick professional tips for editing. When you're editing, match your cuts or edits to music if you're, if you're doing that kind of video. Cirque Among Us, that very, um, after Pete the Cat, um, that very first video I showed you um, is a good example of that. What I did was I set the music down, laid the music down, and then I timed the cuts in the video to, um, with the beat of the music. So it can really add a little bit of enthusiasm to your overall project and a little bit of professionalism to your project. Be careful that you don't separate your audio and video when you're editing sound bites. The two tracks, especially if you're using Premiere or Premiere Elements, can be linked and unlinked. And in most cases, you don't wanna, want to unlink them because if you do and your video and, edit, video and audio gets just a little bit off, then your video is going to turn into a badly dubbed martial arts movie and none of us want that. Okay, <clears throat> I think we're in the home stretch here. So what do I do with the videos now that I have them? YouTube, because everything that you make and you probably should, everything that you do make and probably should, ev ah, I don't know where I'm going. I'm trying to talk too fast. Let me start over. <laughs> There's no reason not to use YouTube, folks. That's where I'm trying to go with this. Um, it's going to give you the most reach. Uh, people from all over the world can view your videos, obviously. It's really easy to share your videos um, on social media that you posted on YouTube. Um, you can change your privacy s settings if you want someone else to view it before you make it public. You have all those options available with YouTube. Vimeo is a popular site, especially for high production value videos. So it's more suited really for the promotional or image videos that you might create that are going to take you a little bit more time and more production value. Your website, obviously. Some of the modern web platforms make it really easy to add videos. I use Concrete 5. It has a YouTube block that can be added to the pages. Um, and some may also allow you to embed videos on your web page. If you post videos to your web page, you can easily share those on your social media sites. That'll get back to your web page, add traffic to your web page. So that's, that's a win-win all around. Social media, obviously, videos posted to YouTube can be shared really easily on social media. 
You can also upload videos directly to most social media platforms. Um, for instance, the Pete the Cat, the only place that is was immediately um, uploaded directly to Facebook. Niche Academy, I mentioned this briefly, um, it offers a platform for uploading tutorial videos. They can create some videos for you, but you can also create and upload your own. And I talked about some of those with our training videos specifically. Oh, okay, <laughs> so we're running very short on time, but if there are there any more questions, Paula, that I can take before we wrap up? Not yet. Let's see. Go ahead and type in the chat box. We've got about five more minutes. And then again, we can share her information uh, with her email or phone or whatever she wants. So um, you can talk directly to her as well. And perhaps when you're watching the video recap of this, you can put me on slow-mo so maybe you can actually understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Eventually, I will get it transcribed. So that will be good. <laughs> She's got tons of info. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Ah, there you go. Okay, so if you have any more questions, if you want to talk to me, if you want to email me, um, there's my contact information. Feel free to get in touch. Uh, there's also our YouTube page. So virtually all the videos, um, except for the training videos, I believe, that I showed you are uploaded to our YouTube page. So um, feel free to watch those at your leisure. Good question. Are you going to be doing any programs at the conferences coming up? I have not been asked to at this point. But if someone were to ask me, I would probably say yes. I might ask her. Um, I would probably say yes to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Scott asked, um, did you have to learn your software while you were editing? We have no time to learn the program and then use it. Um, that's how I learned most things. That's how I learned to use InDesign. That's how I learned to use Premiere. Now, I did have my husband that I could ask questions, but really, that's the way I learn it. I don't have time to sit down and learn it either. So I, I jump in and I, I just give it a go. If I run into a problem, I look up a tutorial on YouTube and uh, that gets me through it until I come across the next problem. <laughs> so yes, I just jump right in and go for it. Okay, we've got lots of thank yous. Um, we've already, people are talking about ILF maybe. And I'm, <laughs> I'm first, I'm asking first. And if you have, I mean, I know I saw somebody would be interested in, in additional um, videos on marketing. If you have any ideas for subjects, I would be happy to um, to think about putting those together. Yeah, and let me know too. We can see what else we can do. Well, to, together, this is really easy to do this, that I can come up to your libraries, and I'm actually here at Kendallville doing this webinar with Jenna. Yeah, I think it's it's fantastic that there's such a, such an interest, and uh, I hope I hope that I've um, I hope I've made it clear that it, it really. It's important, and it doesn't take a whole lot of time and effort to do. You can do some things very simply, especially once you get